So I believe we are down to the last play tonight by uh, Peg Flatch. And Peg, I will turn it over to you and you can do the introductions. This is a th series of three monologues that uh, I wrote to perhaps stand alone or to perhaps be paired with another series of three monologues I did that First Run Theater produced last season called Screaming at Optimum Pitch. Um, building on those characters, or perhaps it stands alone. And I will let my narrator, I'll introduce Shirley Stewart is gonna be the narrator. Um, Labyrinth will be played by? Jen Kerner. Insulation will be played by? Rita Winters. And Dementia Diary will be played by? Michelle Dillard. And I will exit now. Trilogy of Monologues by Peg Flack. Cast of characters. Labyrinth, woman aged 25 to 50-ish. Insulation, woman aged 40 to 50-ish. The Dementia Diamond, woman aged 50 to 60-ish. Offstage voice, for cast, cast member of, or any member of the cast. Time, present. Setting, simple set. Labyrinth, empty stage. And insulation is a kitchen table and chair, and Dementia Diamond is a chair center stage. The house lights dim. An offstage voice says, often our lives reflect the art form of a mosaic, a pattern or image made of small, regular, or irregular pieces joined in some way. Relationships between human souls mortared in place by the power of caring, mother to daughter, adult to child, caregiver to aged, life, death, and what happens in between, bonding spirits in the multiple dimensions of reality, mosaic, labyrinth, sound effect in darkness, kaleidoscope of confusing sounds, Project, uh, projected slide is a labyrinth, and rise, the slide and the sound fade away as the actor enters from the wings and walks along the outer path of an imaginary labyrinth on the stage during the monologue. As she spirals inward, she pauses at intervals when her back is to the audience and proceeds in silence until she faces the audience again to continue. Hello, I'm here, right here. Do you see me? Ha, ah, there was a glance just now. No expression, just a glance, <laughs> but I'll take that. What do you see? For a while there, I had a theory that you have some sort of alignment with cats. Both of you could see things that over time, human society has simply chosen to delete from cognitive awareness. Do you see radio waves? sparks of raw energy that the rest of us have evolved away as we erased whatever sense controlled that reality? <laughs> Makes you wonder who exactly did the evolving. The actor's back is to the audience, walking. You know, I fantasize about truly walking in your world, that inner part that my path won't reach, just for a while to really experience your reality so that I can understand what you see and hear and feel. Why you sometimes have too much sensory input and have to shut down all receptors and retreat to your own secure, safe place. You do seem content to be there at times. At other times, it seems like an agony of confusion. The actor's back is to audience, walking. What is it like to you? You let me briefly into this safe space between us, but the core of this labyrinth to your reality Actor, is Sorry, over there. Actor indicates the labyrinth. It's over there. I, I seem to have a tether of sorts linked to outside this space. What if I decided that I like it better there than here and am tempted to join you in this unique utopian shrine of our own design. The actor's back is to the audience, walking. 
I remember when you used to read my mind. Do you remember? You were maybe six years old. At first it happened circumstantially. I would be working with you doing fill in the blank exercises like I went to the zoo and I saw a blank. We were building vocabulary and I expected something like tiger. My mind was drifting and I was thinking about, oh, I don't remember, fried chicken. And out of the blue, you said fried chicken. <laughs> Where did that come from, I thought. You gradually stopped softly saying out of context words that you somehow were able to retrieve. Thoughts that had been percolating in the privacy of my mind that only you could hear. I don't know whether to mourn your loss of that perception or celebrate your step into this reality. Actors back to audience, walking. One of my most insightful memories was at a powerful guided group meditation. The spoken guide took us into a relaxed state and told us that we were entering a peaceful, beautiful space. We were guided to, with our intention, reach out and grasp a doorknob, turn it, open the door, and step over a threshold. Nothing was visible as I reached out my hand into this safe, serene fog to wait. When I felt a grasp on my hand, I was instructed to look to see who it was. And it was you. Actor's back is to audience. She steps high through a threshold. Actor looks around more and more with curiosity and continues walking the labyrinth. In that guided meditation, you took me to tangled areas of my life. You helped me to see clearly what my options were and, and how some pieces fit together just right. It was a powerful, insightful experience that led me on a path of healing and self-actualization. And ironically, it was you helping me. I believe that was the closest I have come to truly needing you. Were you stepping into my world or was I stepping into yours? Was it all fabricated in the desires of my mind or did you sense being there too? Actors back is to audience, walking, looking. I have learned so much from you and the loving presence of your family. They truly value you as the person you are not a person diagnosed with autism, but their child, their grandchild, their sibling. It's been an honor to know you as I'm supposedly hired to lessen the distance between our worlds. I think that indeed you were put in my life to teach me to look at the world differently. Andrew's back is to audience. Walking to the center of the labyrinth, she turns and faces the audience. I'm at the center of the labyrinth and I need to go back now. I would love to take you with me. Actor lowers herself slightly to the height of a 10 year old child and offers her hand to a child with autism. Please take my hand. Show me how. End of labyrinth. Playwright notes, via her intent and words, the actor portrays the outer labyrinth that she walks as representing the communication space between the actor and the child with autism. The inner labyrinth embodies the world of the child with autism. Next, insulation. Sound effect in the darkness, muffled speech, like a radio playing through the buffer or under a blanket, soft fading ambulance siren. Projected slide, an accident scene. At rise, the slide and the sound fades as lights come up on a woman, mid-40s. She is stylishly dressed and overweight. She is seated in a kitchen chair. To her right is a small table with coffee, plate of food, notebook, pen. She sips coffee sporadically.
You're on mute. You're on mute, Rita. She sips coffee sporadically. Oh, my shrink cat's name is Joy. Isn't it bizarre that in a quest for relief, I basically hired someone to help find a way through all this, this pain and her name ends up being Joy? Who makes up these rules of irony? God? Joy? I see fuzzy remnants of what I used to remember as Joy in my life here on the periphery of my vision and out there. He indicates with her hand. Like fairy wings, wispy, rounded, with the occasional open space, almost like fog, but with more substance. Sips coffee. I made my first shrink hat cry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here I am spilling out the woes of my life, just having commented on the fact that I felt there just wasn't anything left to live for, feeling ever so much more than shitty. And tears start streaming down her cheeks. She actually said, you really don't have anything to live for. This is supposed to make me feel better. This is a healthy comment to give to a grieving person. One thing I do like about Joy, she pretty much tells me that if it makes me feel better, do it. And I have taken her advice. For the past few years, several things have indeed made me feel better. Decorating. I ripped out walls and painted and refurbished and remodeled and shopped and bought I didn't leave an intact shrine. I know someone who went to view a house that was for sale. One bedroom was a typical kid's room. Bed unmade, shoes on the floor, book open. Not the pristine tidiness that you usually come to expect when viewing real estate. Their daughter had died seven years before and they'd left the room exactly as she had left it. Just shut the door and left it like a temple frozen in time. There is the urge to do that, to try very hard to freeze time or even better go back. Oh, and then there's eating. People bringing food to grieving people. Keep up your strength. I have quite, given quite a lot of thought to that. I think that everyone wants to do something, but they don't know quite what to do. So they scroll back and get to the basics. Food, drink, sleep, things everyone has to do to be healthy. You talk toss back some wine at the wake, but it tends to make people uncomfortable if you keep that up for very long. Your doctor will easily prescribe sleeping pills also for a while, but food, People just keep bringing it and bringing it. If they bring you food, they are representationally bringing you health and wellness to bridge your sorrow. Well, she looks down appraising her body. She looks up stricken, melting, emotionally cries. About 30 pounds of sorrow so far. If only I kept her from getting in that car. If only I'd had my mother radar on to recognize what danger she was in. If only I'd taken her shopping or something that night. If only I somehow kept her from dying so young. He absently takes a bite of food, goes to take another bite, regards it, and puts it back. Decorating, eating. There's a sort of insulation I spray around myself to dull the sharp edges of memory that keep poking me, opening up old wounds, piercing my skin, making fresh cuts each time I think, if only I had... She shakes it off. It was so interesting when I realized that I had gained 30 pounds. 
exactly the weight gain I had when I was pregnant. It all settled, you know, right in front here too. I could rest my hands on my stomach and remember that exact posture. It's like she was back, cocoon deep inside of me, or maybe like she never left. A friend in our bereavement group had so much angst because she worried constantly that her son was okay. Was he happy? Did he need her? I'm spared that persistent agony. It's not even necessarily religious faith that I draw upon. It could be, it could be. It's more just knowing that she really is fine. Well, that and the visits. It started the night of my daughter's wake. My husband and I were at the church for hours with the serpentine line of people all grappling with that toxic internal amalgam of equal parts of grief and relief. Grief, because on the periphery of the mind, each one had always imagined that call from the police. And then a guilty relief that this wasn't their child, it wasn't their friend or their sister. As we arrived home about 10 o'clock, we were met by a friend on the last shift of house sitting she asked where there might have been a lit candle. She described how she had been awakened from a doze on the couch by the strong scent of a recently extinguished candle, just as we had been pulling into the driveway. Hmm. What she didn't know is that we were often met with that very distinct smell when we were turning home from an evening out. My daughter disguised a multitude of telltale odors by burning candles. She'd quickly blow out the candle when she heard us pull into the driveway, knowing that the reprimand she'd get for having lit the candles was a lot less severe than the stench of cigarettes or pot. Here she was, just days after her death, still thumbing her nose at us. There was a lot of activity for several weeks, little reminders that she was around. Um, a visit in the shower where I distinctly heard her voice in my head as she said, Mother, get over it. This was all comforting. And so at first when Joy encouraged me to talk with you, it just seemed silly, bordering on self-absorbed. But as I put my thoughts into words, it really did help me to acknowledge what my life had been and where it was going to recognize the change and to honor it. And that the best person to help me is surprisingly me. I will never be the same person that I was before. I'll always carry the sense of sorrow and loss. But as time passes, the, the memories ease, the pain dulls ever so slightly and I shed a layer. Sometimes I succumb to the numbing effects of chocolate and anything that brings even a moment of gratification. But then I recognize it and I shed another layer. Pauses as if formulating the following sentence for transcription. Well, it's like I can't go back and live the life I had before, but I can start from now and make a new ending. Nods, content with the wording, she picks up journal and pen and writes as lights fade. End of insulation. The Dementia Diamond. Sound in the darkness. Is I'm in heaven, cheek to cheek. The slide is a puffball dandelion. At the rise, the slide and the sound fade. As a woman is seated in a comfortable chair mid-stage, she is chatty and upbeat. I remember that day you gave me the diamond. 90 years old, three times whittled, Recovering from strokes and cancer under your belt, you had become quite familiar with hospitals, 
when I finally coerced you from the sunny beaches of Sarasota, Florida, back to Illinois. Remember what you always said, Siesta Key is the closest I'll ever get to heaven. Yes, I gave away your car and your Florida driver's license. But remember, I did get you one of those Illinois state IDs that kind of look like a driver's license. You trusted me with all of the power of attorney papers. But then taking prescribed medicines correctly became a really gnarly issue. But you did pay your own bills, balancing your checkbook to the penny, but not quite getting the hang of that whole debit card system. Oh, we did enjoy swimming too. And that hot tub when it was working at your independent living senior complex. Remember the concert with the country singer in the community room that went on way too long? We snuck out, grabbed some wine, and headed back to look at the birds in that big bird cage around the corner from your apartment. Then several ER visits that fall, and then that three-day hospital stay, after that 21-day stint in the rehabilitation unit, you surprised me by giving me your one-carat diamond ring. Thanks, Ma. Cool, I thought, and promptly took it to a jewelry store for a lovely new setting. Hey, maybe it is good to be the only daughter. Thanks, Ma. The next month, you moved into assisted living. And I started going to the support group for caretakers. Lots of practical information and moral support. I didn't mind taking over your bills. You really left it all organized and easy to follow. Everything was paper and mail. No online payments to track down. Boy, did I not miss worrying about the four times per day medicine and shots and eye drops. The nurses in your new digs and skilled nursing took care of all of that now. Then, three months later, out of the blue, <laughs> this is true, Mom. You glance down at your ring finger and ask, where's my diamond ring? Yeah, you did. Plans were percolating in my head to take the ring back to the jeweler and have it reset back in your original ring when I remembered something shared by a woman in that caretaker support group. She said that her mother had a pair of one carat diamond earrings that were always being misplaced, left on the sink or laying about. She said that she was planning to tell her mother that she was having them cleaned while actually swiping out a pair of cubic zirconia. Well, I pondered that option. Then I remembered missing cash and gift cards from your room from time to time. And that helped me to justify this as a daughter's sensible act of deception. Yeah. Within a week, you were happily wearing that new fall diamond. Then a few months down the path, mom, you really did this. You pulled me aside with a sweet smile on your face and said, I've been thinking about this for a while. How would you like to have my diamond ring? <laughs> Truth. I just didn't know how many times that this was going to play out, but it really didn't matter. I wore both of those rings side by side. Actor holds out hand with two diamonds side by side, looks and smiles. Actually, mom, I'd be hard pressed to choose which I liked best, diamond or fake diamond. If in a few months, if you had asked me where the diamond ring was, hey, I had it covered. Each day, every visit I watched her fuzzy seas of memory Gently disconnect and drift away like a white puffball dandelion in a gentle wind. You know you were often difficult and unsatisfied, but now 
Now you existed in this soft haze of contentment. I'm so grateful for that. It was just you and me when you died on the crisp March morning in 2018, just like you wanted. Your ashes were sprinkled just off the Florida shoreline. Good Lord, Ma. I'm so grateful that you missed the whole pandemic. What would I have done if you were in a nursing home and I was totally powerless to watch over you? So to honor the outstanding and feisty woman who you were, I will continue to wear and truly cherish both the physical presence of and the family lore behind your dementia diamond. Mom, sort of your digital shrine. She waves her fingers and smiles at her pun. Actor saddens, drops head, looks up. I miss you. Looks at the rings on her hand and smiles. For everything. Thanks, Ma. End of the Dementia Diamond. End of the play. Hey, I've got to say, I find your writing captivating. Uh, just the dialogue, especially, just captivates me, and it's uh, this is so touching. Um, I do. I have a specific question, but just one question. Feel free to respond uh, to anything that you have on your mind. One thing I was thinking of is that you know when you present a, a mon monologues live on stage, it's a, a little different beast. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a, of a different challenge. So one question I would ask the audience is, can you imagine this on stage? And do you want to uh, offer any of your thoughts to Peg on that front? But again, it's just one, one question that I'd bring forward here. The usual topics are all a fair game. So with that, who has something to, to comment on? Oh, hell yes. This was fantastic. <laughs> Every single monologue hit me in a different place. They were really fantastic. Um, I'm still moved, particularly by the last one, um, uh, having had a few friends go through uh, early dementia and uh, know what that like. But uh, um, all of them were moving in different ways. And it's so wonderful to have original, new monologues for women uh, it's women's history month this month so it's like great timing so um i thought they were beautifully performed tonight by everyone i'm uh, trying not to cry <laughs> that last one really hit me in a hard place so Beautiful. yeah letting you guys go so uh, fantastic i would I say wanted to say that i'm so struck by the imagery in peg's monologues because yes there's moving dialogue, but I was so struck by everything, the labyrinth, the diamonds, the zirconia, the, um, the imagery of having the 30 pounds of weight mimic the pr original pregnancy, that just blew me away. Peg, it worked two years ago with Optimum Pitch, this will work too. <laughs> I mean, they're just, they're just fabulous model. I, yes, I really love the last one because yeah uh my father died just before covid came in and years before that had eight years of my mother with dementia so yes constantly repeating says well here let me give you this well you gave us that before so love the it. verb the verbiage was very good and <laughs> yeah i i when i first read it when when you sent it to me i was in tears and kind of bumming for a few days after that. But, you know, a lot of people need to know that that's how things are. I, I love the spiritual part of uh, Labyrinth with the start of it, too. Um, I've, I've walked Labyrinths before, and they are kind of a special experience when you do that type of thing. Um, I, I love the, the imagery of that walk and the transformation and the, the change that she was doing and actually bringing 
the child along with her really at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was a, it was a beautiful story. And, uh, and all of these monologues I think are fantastic. I think uh, it's, it's wonderful to have these types of things. I would, I mean, I feel like I've seen it on stage already. I, wonder- I felt like the, the labyrinth one, she was talking to her 10 year old self. Am I wrong or? We'll let uh, Peg answer that question before we're done. Or do you perhaps know me too well, Shirley Stewart? <laughs> Fun fact, um, the actor reading Labyrinth is herself on the spectrum. So I enjoyed that. I, I um, quite enjoyed having that, that picture of a different type of mind, a different way of thinking, being honored as something equal, Mm -hmm. rather than being seen as this thing that we have to break you of. So thank you, thank you, I love that. (laughs) I just saw a video this morning, I didn't realize that Amy Schumer had been married and her husband's on the spectrum and they've come really out about that and talked about that in a HBO special, I guess, and they're doing a, a thing, a cooking show together. He's a big chef and stuff. And, and it's really interesting how she's really honoring that part of him in his autism. And, and, and it's, it's fantastic. I was thinking that these monologues could actually be made into individual playlets with, you know, several characters, like in the last one, the daughter conversing with the mother and show the mother giving the ring and getting the ring back and so on, you know, in the same way with the other two monologues that you you could actually convert them into uh, plays, which might be even more interesting. I also like the way the uh, visits from the daughter were handled. I mean, we couldn't see that happen, but the way you wrote that, it was like almost a normal part of life rather than something super spooky. It was something comforting. And I really like that because I've had those experiences. Well, and I, I wanted to jump in just for a second and uh, give some love to the second one because that was my personal favorite. That one was really good. And I, the line that very early on that hit me was when she goes to the therapist and the therapist was like, I don't know what, I, I, what do you have to live for? That's I, I really hope that wasn't from uh, actual lived experience, but uh, that was truly powerful and, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I agree I, with you, Chris. All three were fantastic monologues. I think uh, it's, it's terrific. I'd love to be able to share these with a lot of my actress friends because I think they would, they would eat this material up. I mean, I think any, any actress would feel very blessed to perform any of these pieces. Going back to the book that I would just imagine this as an audio recording too, I'm thinking outside of just on stage, I could imagine this as an audio still be very effective, I think. I'd have to agree with everyone. I just bravo, Peg. Well done. This is good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, Peg, I think it's we should turn it over to you for final comments. Well, thank you for your comments. I really appreciate it. Great okay. deal. And surely, yeah, actually, that was written from the perspective of I'm a speech pathologist by trade, a speech pathologist working with a child on the spectrum. That's that was my intent to convey with that one. And uh yeah, I'm, I'm really highly influenced by David Sedaris and Irma Bombeck and vagina monologues. And I, I like monologues. That seems to be something I, I tried to divert off into some dialogue-based writing and stuff. And I just end up back with the monologues. <laughs> I really like to do <laughs> because it blends storytelling and a lot of different other things that I have interests in. So uh, I appreciate your comments. And Michelle, did I forget to, did I forget to introduce you? your part? Um, no. No, I didn't? Okay. I, I thought I had a little brain fog there <laughs> at the beginning. So everybody got introduced. I appreciate the actresses. Oh my gosh. You guys did a wonderful job. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Brought it all to life. And I really appreciate your talents. Acting was incredible. Uh, the play itself is incredible. And so Egg, I- I'd have... 
I'd happily sit through an evening of your monologues. Oh, good. <laughs> it's <Definitely>. therapy. <laughs> and I think we should thank all of the uh, playwrights tonight and all the actors one more time. Fantastic from everybody. Nice. Very good. Thank you very much. And the comments are always so, so fantastic. And, and I think really, truly helpful to the playwrights. So we I'd like to give a special thanks to our out of town reader. Uh, Mark, yeah. Yes. Mark, yes. Mark, thank you. Thank you for having me, Mari. I really appreciate being invited. It's always, I mean, my gosh, right now we don't really get much theater. And, right. and so this is, this is like a blessing. Yeah. And Chris, you, you're, you're welcome back here. anytime. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would, I would love to, I'm, if you'll have me, I'll be here. Keep in okay. touch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always need actors. I can't be doing it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right.